good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Salvation Basics class on this Sunday, uh, 30th January 2022. And today my message is entitled, Before or After Christ? And our key text is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, uh, chapter, um, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11, verse 13. And the word of God reads, These all died uh, in faith, but not having received the promises, um, but having seen them afar off and were uh, persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. All right, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this time to be back in this class with the preaching and teaching of this class. Lord, Lord, I thank you for those who are here. Uh, I, I ask that, Lord, you will bless them for their faithfulness. And Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, power to um, open their eyes, open their minds and open their hearts that they may understand uh, uh, your word and that your word um, will um, will reach into them and, and and touch each and every one of them in their own way, uh, that they may come to see uh, 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 that they need, uh, those here who are not saved, that they need salvation and they need to repent and they need to put themselves uh, uh, into the hands of Christ to save them. So Lord, I just ask that you lead me and guide me. Uh, even now, uh, I pray that uh, you bless this time as we commit this uh, this uh, this uh, pre, uh, this uh, class into your hands. In Jesus' name, uh, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen. Um, uh, rather than do a recap of last week, uh, I'm just going to go very quickly into my introduction. Um, last week, <laughs> um, prior to the afternoon service, uh, a friend asked how people were saved, you know, Old Testament uh, before Jesus Christ. Um, how they were saved before Christ's death on the cross. And uh, so this week, I will, um, this week, I will attempt to explain from scriptures how that came about. Uh, but there's just simply too many passages of scriptures to, to share. Um, so so um, uh, I will share but some, right? Uh, however, it is enough that God says it one time. Right? Amen? Um, anyway, so I'm just going to dive straight into this. Um, God is unchanging, right? God is unchanging. God is an everlasting God. Uh, God's been from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2, uh, the Word of God reads, Lord, uh, Thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, uh, or ever Thou had, uh, hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You know, uh, um, then we hear about the psalmist's praise of God's majesty in Psalm 93, verse 2. Um, well, Psalm 93, but I want, just want to focus on verse 2. And verse 2 reads, Thy throne is established uh, of old. Thou art from everlasting. Uh, thou art from everlasting. Then uh, we hear from King Nebuchadnezzar, right? The Babylonian king. Uh, who was full of himself, and he said uh, he, he kind of like surveyed his palace grounds and he surveyed the, the city that he was in. And he said, oh, you know, all this came about because of me. And then God dealt with him. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 34, we read, and of, well, God dealt with him. And, um, and, and when he came out of his madness, um, he, he realized it wasn't him. Uh, it was all, all of God's work. Uh, and... Um, and he acknowledged uh, a God, and he acknowledged the eternality of God in Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. Um, and the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes, my, uh, mine eyes unto heaven, uh, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. His understanding returned unto him. Uh, he was driven out of the palace. He was mad for, for, for a spell. But let me finish reading. But I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him, that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Okay, what am I doing this? Uh, um, why am I saying this uh, or, or, or preaching this uh, regarding before or after Christ? Well, first off, um, I just want to establish um, uh, where God stood or where God stands in all this in terms of a timeline. And then we'll, and, and hopefully by the end of the message, you'll understand. Right? First, God is um, an everlasting God, uh, and with God, there's no end. All right? Everlasting means everlasting. There's no end. Uh, Psalm 102, verses 25 and 20, uh, through 27, 
of old hast thou said, or rather, of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Uh, they, are, uh, they shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. Verse 27, but thou art the same, and thy, ear, and thy years shall have no end. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Um, then we see more of this in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Uh, how you know God is an everlasting God, and um, and uh, Ephesians uh, three twenty uh, th- chapter three verses twenty and twenty one say now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us in verse twenty one and to him be glory in the church of, uh, by Christ uh, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end Amen. And Isaiah had this to say in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, For unto us a child is born, uh, uh, denoting Jesus, and unto us a son is given, and government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end, right? There's no end to his, uh, uh, to his kingdom. There's no end uh, to his reign. Uh, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts ha- will perform this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this, right? So it's God performing all, you know, all of this. And with God, there's wisdom from the beginning, right? God is unchanging and with, you know, God's wisdom doesn't change. He's not He's not willingly. Uh, he's not willingly. Uh, not willy nilly. Rather, he's not like man, uh, um, who is unstable, who may change. Uh, you know, one moment he may say this, next moment he may say that. But God is steadfast. God is sure, uh, and 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 God doesn't change. Right? And and God has had. You know, with God is wisdom right from the beginning. Um, have a look at Proverbs chapter eight. Right? Uh, you, can, you can read the entire chapter, but I just want to focus on verses 22 and 23. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 and 23. The Lord uh, possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. Uh, uh, this is wisdom speaking, right? In verse, 20, in verse 23, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. And, um, and, and with God, um, you know, God, and I, pre- I preached this before, God is a God who says what he means and he means what he says. And his works uh, were, 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 were based on wisdom. Uh, it is something that's considered. It's not frivolous. His works are not works of frivolity. Uh, and then you look at um, um, chapter, you know, uh, same chapter of Proverbs, uh, verses 24 through 31. And I'll read that. Uh, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, meaning wisdom. When there was no fountains abounding water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I brought uh, was I brought forth. Um, so all these things, were, oh, what God did was uh, was God established everything by wisdom. In verse twenty six, while as yet He had not made the earth, uh, nor the fields, nor the highest uh, part, uh, uh, the highest part of the dust of the world, uh, when He prepared the heavens, I was there. Speak, uh, meaning wisdom again. Um, when he set a compass about the face, uh, upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to, uh, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight. God's delight is wisdom, right? Rejoicing before, uh, rejoicing always before him, verse 31, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Even if God was foolish, right? even if he's foolish, God's foolishness right, is far, far, far beyond the wisdom of man, beyond the understanding of man. And um, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. Right? Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Right? Uh, when it comes to God, man cannot outdo him. Man cannot be cleverer than him. Man is not wiser than him. Man is not stronger than him. Simply put, man is nothing but a created being, and there's nowhere near God in terms of power, in terms of wisdom, in terms of anything and everything. Right? Um, 
And God is the everlasting word. And God's word is everlasting. God is the everlasting word, and God is, is God's word, rather God's word is everlasting. God's word is pure. Psalm uh, chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of fire, purified seven times. Right? Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, and thou shalt preserve them from, uh, from this generation forever. So why am I going on about the word of God? Well, the thing is that we take, we understand all things about God from the word of God. And, I will, and I'm trying to explain this from the Word of God. And, I got to, and I've got to establish the authority of the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, the purity of the Word of God, and, uh, and, and the eternality of the Word of God. And God's Word will not pass away. All right? Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So God's Word is going to remain forever, and God's Word is sure. Right? Verse, uh, Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise or simple. Um, God's word is, is certain, it is sure, it is there to stay what he says he means and what he means he says. Um, and God's word is true. Um, there's, there's no lie in God's word. There's no, um, you know, uh, God doesn't uh, uh, God doesn't say one thing to trick man, and then you know, and on the other hand, say, "Ha ha ha! You believe me, you fool!" No, God's word is true. All right, uh, Psalm one hundred and nineteen, verse uh, verse one hundred and sixty: Thy word is true from the beginning; every one of thy righteous judgment endureth forever. And God's word is alive, and God's word discerns. Right, Hebrews chapter four, verse twelve. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, repiercing even to the uh, dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It is so sharp, right? The word of God is so sharp that it can divide the soul and the spirit. And uh, man, um, ha- you know, even I myself have, have issues uh, 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 understanding or rather uh, uh, telling the difference between the spirit and the soul. Um, but God's word is so sharp that it can divide asunder the soul and the spirit and of the joints and marrow and is, the cerner, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, right? So God's word is powerful. God's word is quick, quick meaning alive, right? And sharp. Um, it is alive and it discerns. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the hearts of men. And the thing is that God does not change. Um, uh, uh, um, God is unchanging. God is immutable. He doesn't change. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, God doesn't lie. It is impossible to lie. So God who says, uh, God uh, as word who's, uh, that is true, um, um, uh, uh, that is sure, uh, tells us that God is in the you know, God cannot lie. He, it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation. It is because God cannot lie, that we, uh, we can trust God uh, and we can trust what he says, right? Uh, that we can have strong consolation, we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. And Hebrews chapter 1 verse 12, as a vesture thou shalt fold them, uh, fold them up and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, thy years shall not fail. So, you know, Scriptures say that God is immutable. God doesn't change. God doesn't lie. Therefore, we can trust what God has to say. And um, and, ver- and Hebrews chapter thirteen verse eight: Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ Himself doesn't change. Right? Uh, Jesus didn't 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 say, "Well, you know, I'll die today on the cross and shed my blood, and then tomorrow I'll take everything back." He doesn't do that. Uh, uh, he will not do that. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, for I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. All right, God is an angry God. God hates the works of iniquity. And um, why wouldn't he consume, why would he want to consume the sons of Jacob? Well, because they have sinned against God. Israel was a chosen kingdom, was a chosen nation of God. And they went a whoring after other gods and God was angry with them. And God was, uh, was wroth with sin. And, um, but because of God's promise to Abraham, to Jacob, and and to the and 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 to the you know the forefathers of of, of Israel that he will that you he'll, he'll make a great nation out of them and so on and so forth. Therefore, he says, "I change not, and therefore I will not destroy you." Therefore, 
your sons of, of Jacob are not consumed because God is the same. The entire world can trust him at all times. But the thing is that, what about salvation before Christ, right? Um, if God said all this, but yet, you know, you know, Jesus Christ did not die until about 2,000 years ago. But, but you know, there, but Israel, ex, uh, uh, Israel and the world uh, existed before Jesus Christ. So how then? How did, um, how did the world come about? No, ra- ra- sorry. How did salvation come about before then? Uh, so we look at salvation before and after Christ, right? The thing is, God exists outside of time. This is one of my favorite examples when I, you know, you know, you know, when, uh, uh, when I teach this class. Um, unlike God, or rather, unlike man, God has got no uh, concept of time, meaning that uh, there's no constraints of time upon him. Time means nothing to him. He exists outside of time simply because he made time, right? Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, and he was before all things. You know, what, you know, what does all mean but all? He was before all things. Um, and, be, and by him, because of him, and because of God, and by God, all things are, all things consist. John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made by him. All things means all things, right? Um, uh, uh, the planets, the stars, um, uh, um, physics, right? You know, time, the world, us, people, animals, trees, whatever. All things uh, were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Simply put, without him, nothing was made. It was because of him all things were made. And as such, time does not have the same meaning with God as it does with man. Second, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that, a, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So, you know, you know, as far as God's concerned, one day can seem like a thousand years, and a thousand years can seem like a day to him. But because he's been from everlasting to everlasting, um, um, uh, uh, you know, this concept may be a bit difficult for the unsaved man to grasp. Um, it's like, well, you know, how can that be? But the thing is that, um, think of it this way, all right? God exists outside of time. And before creation, uh, there was no time, nothing, you know, the, uh, the word of God in Genesis says there was, everything was a void, right? Um, think of it this way. Uh, think of a bookshelf, right? Uh, you know, your library, you're, you're facing a bookshelf, and there are different shelves, and there are different um, uh, compartments of shelves. You've got vertical ones, you've got horizontal ones. And that's, how, and that's what time is to God, right? God sees everything at the same time. Uh, he sees the beginning, and he sees the end, and he sees everything in between. And um, this, is he, you know, this is the time he made everything, this is the time... Uh, he judged the world, he, he, where he judges the world in righteousness and, 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 and all eternity and everything in between. So he, he knows everything already. He knows what's going to happen here. He knows what's going to happen here. And as far as he's concerned, it's already happened, right? Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense, right? Um, again, bookshelf, um, God is outside of the bookshelf. He looks at the bookshelf and that's time, all right? And, um, and, and, and to him, and unlike us, where, you know, a day is 24 hours, uh, I'm preaching right now, and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen two hours, three hours down the road, right? But God already knows, because he's outside of time. He sees things outside of time, right? He sees things now, and he's, he's already seen things a couple of hours down the road, as far as I'm concerned, right? Salvation was, or, was ordained before the world. And I've preached this before, you know, before God created anything, he had already ordained the salvation of man by Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 21. Uh, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was, made, but was manifest in these, la- in these times for you, who by him do believe in God, right? Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So the thing is that God's, God ordained the foundation, or rather ordained um, uh, salvation 
before the world, before he created the world, before the foundation of the world. So, uh, so you know, again, you, 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 if, you, if you were to take my time, uh, uh, you know, my bookshelf ex- example, Christ had already died on the cross. He ordained uh, the self, you know, Christ, the blood of Christ um, before the foundation of the world, right? Before he created everything. So far as God's concerned, Christ had already died and spilled his blood on the cross, right? Um, but the thing is that it has been made clear that salvation was not an afterthought of God in the Garden of Eden or after that or anything like that, right? Uh, God said in 1 Peter chapter 1 already, you know, before he made anything, the blood of Christ was already ordained, right? And it's because of his omniscience, uh, he laid down whatever was necessary for the salvation of man. Um, having said that, I can hear scorners asking, then why didn't God make anything perfect? Why didn't he make things perfect right from, the, right from the start? Why did he allow all these things to happen? Well, the thing is that he did. He did make everything perfect. Rather, everything was perfect right in the, begin, uh, right in the beginning. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was what? Prior passages said it was good. But verse 31 says it was very good. So God didn't just say good, it was very good, it was exceedingly good. And in the evening and the morning was the sixth day. So if things were perfect, you know, scorners may continue to say, then what went wrong? Everything was perfect, it was perfect. The thing is that God gave man freedom to make his choices. Do you prefer to be a free person, a person at liberty to do what you like, to make your own choices? Um, um, And that's what God did. God gave man freedom to make his choices. And God made, or rather man made a choice to disobey God. Um, Did God twist Adam's arm or Eve's arm to say, I want you to disobey me? If If God had to twist anybody's arm, That is not liberty. It's not free will. It's not freedom. That is coercion, right? Liberty is one of the character, is one of the uh, 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 characteristics of God. It's a character of God, and he gave man that character also. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, uh, the first part of that. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, the things that a lot of people kind of, you know, make that mistake that thinking that, oh, you know, God made man in, uh, uh, in his image in the sense that this is how he appears physically, right? Which is why, which is why in so many churches, you find, you find a portrait pur- uh, uh, purporting to be Christ. One of the things that nobody knows what Christ looks like now, right? Um, you know, Christ died on the cross uh, arose the third day and ascended up into the heaven uh, I, 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 not long thereafter. And after that, you know, uh, the, his disciples, his, uh, his, you know, his followers his, who were with him, you know, have long since died. And so nobody knows how, uh, how, how Christ looks like. But yet, people make the mistake of saying, well, you know, this is Christ. This is a benign looking man, long flowing hair, uh, handsome, handsome uh, uh, face. Uh, but that's not the image that God was talking about. Um, um, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, the thing is that today man has got liberty to make choices. That image, that characteristic of God, that, characteristic, uh, that character trait of God, uh, uh, that, that image, right? You know, God has not shackled anyone to obey him at all times, right? God did not say that, you know, did not twist Adam's finger, bend it backwards painfully and say, you will obey me, otherwise I'll break your finger. No, God didn't do that. Man is not a robot, unable to respond to his conscience in any way. But no choice is without consequence, right? Either, you know, whether it's good or bad. Um, then why aren't all believers like Christ? First, the genuinely saved are still in the same physical bodies. Right? Just because I'm saved does not mean that I am sinlessly perfect. I'm far from being sinlessly perfect. You know, I'm prone to the same temptations as I was before salvation. Second, genuinely saved, the genuinely saved possess the the Spirit of God within them who leads and guides them through the process of daily sanctification. 
you know, real believers will sin less and less and less. They will hate sin more and more and more. But if it's business as usual before salvation, no, uh, 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 after salvation as it was before salvation, then I put it to you that the person was never saved, right? And, um, and not long ago, somebody said that, somebody said he still enjoyed the things that he used to do before. I mean, let me put it to you as a Christian. Um, can I sin right now? Absolutely, I can sin right now. But do I enjoy it? No. Sin no longer has the same meaning to the genuinely saved as it did before, right? Before, I used to like doing this, that, and that, right? But now to do this, that, and that, I no longer enjoy it because the Spirit of God inside me tells me, hey, look, you have sinned against God again, right? Jesus Christ died on the cross, cross shed his blood for you, suffered for you, and you're doing the same, you're doing the very things that Jesus Christ saved you from. And it's not business as usual. But if, some, if someone can say, I enjoy this, I like doing this, then there is a problem, right? And it was not out of contempt or out of malice um, that I told the person that I believe he was not saved at the time simply because that was the information he gave me, right? And I could only go on the information that he gave me. And if, was, if that information was given to me truthfully, then, then you know, um, by the measures of scriptures, the person is not saved. But, you know, hey, that's another story for another time. Um, so this thing about the image is like, God gave us this, this, um, this character trait of liberty, and we are we are free to make choices, right? Um, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, so, so the things that, you know, why, why weren't things perfect? Things were perfect. In the, God, you know, in the Garden of Eden, then man made a wrong choice. But like I said, all choices have got consequences, and, um, and, and that led to the fall of man. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and scorners may say, well, you know, you're a Christian, but how come you're not perfect? How come you still do this? How come you still do that? I already just explained it, right? Um, I'm still in this body of flesh. It is still prone to sin. Uh, don't, don't ever think that just because somebody is a Christian, he is therefore sinless. No, there's no scriptural support for that. And, and God himself said in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that we sin, you know, we go to God, we, we repent, we confess to God, and God is just and righteous, uh, just to forgive us our, all, un, our, all, rather, all our, our unrighteousnesses, right? And, um, and anyway, um, so the thing is, salvation before, um, uh, salvation was ordained before the world, and, um, and, and, and God is outside of time. Um, so the thing is, then, then, then what is it? So, so how do people, how do Old Testament folks get saved? Faith is the key, all right? Uh, Brother Roy, what about repentance? Well, you know, hey, you know, we know that repentance comes first. But the thing is, before we need, before we can put faith in somebody, we need to turn from, turn from whatever to that somebody, right? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an example, uh, one, one example that I use is a parachute. Um, uh, um, you're in the airplane and, and, you know, the engine's running and you're up in the air, smooth sailing, and somebody comes along to you uh, and, say, and says, well, you know, hey, uh, here's a parachute, put it on. Well, why should I put it on? It's not comfortable wearing a parachute. I know, I've worn a parachute before. I've worn a parachute before. I've sat in an airplane. I've flown an airplane, right? And, um, and, 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 and at no point in time did I, need to have that, uh, did I need to use that parachute. But what if the airplane sheds a wing as I'm doing the, you know, the loops and the, and the, and the, and the rolls and, 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 you know, whatever? 
what if it sheds a wing? What's going to happen? Well, the thing is that here's repentance, all right? Here's a parachute. It can save your life. Well, you know, hey, the plane is working just fine. Engine's running fine. Everything is fine. You know, I'm knocking it back. You know, I'm enjoying the food. Leave me alone. I'm not going to wear this uncomfortable thing. And then when the plane catches fire or whatever, it loses an engine, sheds a wing, what's going to happen? You're going to die, right? Repentance is, well, you know, hey, I know that something's going to happen. This is going to save me. Do I accept that? All right, next. Do I take that parachute? Of course I do. It's like it's like having it's like doctor it's like a doctor telling you, hey, you know, you've got a cancer, you need to go for surgery. No, I don't believe you. I don't need surgery. You're gonna die. Um, the repentance part is, I've got cancer. I need surgery. Rather than saying no, I say yes to the doctor, to the surgeon. Yes. I will change, the repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of direction and a change of action. So rather than saying no, I say yes, now I go to the doctor, I go to the surgeon and say, yes, I need, your, I need surgery. And I put my faith and trust in your skills. Like I put my faith and trust in the parachute to save me as I jump out of the airplane. That it will open, that I will float to, uh, down to earth at a, at, 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 a, you know, at a reasonable speed that will not kill me. Okay, you get that? All right, so faith is the key. Faith is the key. It is true that salvation of the world was only possible because Jesus had to die and shed his blood on the cross. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, and almost, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So we know that, blood, that the blood of the innocent had to be shed uh, uh, to, uh, to purge sin, right? Um, and 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, uh, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And John chapter 3, verse 17, And God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus Christ is the Savior of the entire world. So it is true that, you know, we need Jesus Christ. Then how were Old Testament saints saved if Jesus had not died yet, right? You know, when Abraham was, when Jacob, Joseph, um, uh, David, Solomon, Isaiah, and all these uh, 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 giants of faith were, uh, were uh, you, know, you know, when they were alive, Jesus had not died yet. Jesus wasn't even born. Jesus was not born for, uh, for quite a number of years, several hundred years before that. So how were they saved? Um, and, um, and the things that, if they were not saved, then, he, then Hebrews chapter 11 would make God a liar if salvation was only retrospective upon the death of Christ, right? So now today, you know, we look back and, and say, well, you know, hey, Jesus Christ had already died on the, on the cross. He had already shed his blood on the cross. He had already arisen and he already ascended. But during the times of David and Abraham and so on and so forth and Moses, Jesus Christ had not done that yet. You know, remember, Jesus, a God exists outside of time. As such, Christ had already died and shed his blood uh, for the world even before the event of the cross in the, in the physical world of time. Okay? Even if I am wrong with that example, or even as I'm wrong with that example, right? Let scriptures be true and I a liar. Right? Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe and shall they believe make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true in every man a lie as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome uh, 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 when thou art judged. So what this means is that God remains true regardless of what man says or believes. Man does not change God in any way, in any form or in any way. So earlier I established that the word of God is true, the word of God is, um, is, is, is everlasting, so on and so forth. Um, so what does our key text say? Our key text says in Hebrews eleven thirteen, these all died in faith. All right, all these people, all the giants of faith, of faith in, in in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter eleven, all died in faith. They all died believing God, not having received the promises, but what 
having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, all right, they believed God and embraced them, right, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. On, 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 uh, simply put, they believed God implicitly. How were they saved? They believed God implicitly that he would bring to pass what he said. All right, have a, you know, read Hebrews chapter 11. It is a wonderful book of, you know, faith. And, um, and Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 6 says, it, you know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And, uh, the, you know, I, I'm just going to read this, all right? Excuse me, but I'll just move some of my stuff here. And I will read Hebrews chapter 11. And um, Hebrews, oops, I'm on the wrong chapter. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, let me just flip there. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, starting from verse 1, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen. So the things that, you know, I've not seen, you know, I have not seen Jesus Christ dying on the cross, but my faith is in him. Therefore, my hope is in him. My hope is in, in the evidence of things not seen, right? Faith is a substance of things hoped for. I hope for that. I hope to see Christ one day. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that he's my savior and I hope to see him one day. And, and I look forward to that day, right? Of seeing him uh, uh, when he calls, you know, either, either by the rapture, I'm, ca I'm, I'm caught up in the air or after I die, you know, you know, my spirit departs his body and is with God forever, is with Christ forever. Verse two, for by it, the elders receive a good, uh, a good report. Through faith, we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that things that uh, were seen, uh, things which are seen were not made of things which do appear, right? By faith, we believe that God made all this and by God, all things consist and that, you know, all things are held together by God. And uh, verse four, but by faith, Abel offered unto God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain by, the which, uh, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous in God testifying of his gifts and by he being dead yet speaketh, verse. Um, I'm just going to skip a couple of uh, uh, skip a couple of uh, verses. Coming back uh, uh, down to verse six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Right. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and uh, it not just is. He must believe God at you know at face value. You got to believe God at everything that he says. Um, where am I? Um, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God rewards the diligent seeker. And not just a diligent, not just any diligent seeker, but someone who seeks God diligently, seeks God diligently. Um, um, then, then I just want to come down to, to verse 8, right? The word of God says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a, a place, which he should, uh, after receive for inheritance, obeyed. But what? And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Right? You know, today, man, uh, I'm just gonna, uh, I, I'm just gonna leave it, leave it right there. Um, today, you know, man, being a pr being practical and pragmatic, would like to plan. I like to plan this, plan that, plan. And uh, hey, hey, look, you know, I'm going on a trip next week, and I plan. What what sort of plans I make? I, I book uh, uh, air tickets, I book um, accommodations, I book rental cars, things like that. I made plans, right? But with Abraham, what happened? Uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham, when God said, follow me, Abraham dropped, literally dropped everything that he was doing, right? And he went with God, wherever God took him, brought him, led him. Right? Did he know where he was going? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You know, we are prone to asking things like that. You know, we, we don't feel comfortable if we don't know what's, what the future holds or, or what's around the corner. Right? Are we there? But yet Abraham believed God. I right? believed God and, um, and, um, and, and, you know, by faith, he sojourned in the land by, of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs of, with him uh, of the same promise, right? Um, and the thing is that, and the thing is that, 
Abraham and the other faithful giants of old, you don't even have to be a faithful giant. As long as you're faithful, as long as you believe God, they were saved. They believe God implicitly. God said, and they believe, right? God said that I, you know, um, uh, I will establish salvation in the future by the, blood of, by the blood of my son. They believe God. And that faith and that trust saved them. And it was imputed upon them for righteousness, right? It was counted unto them for righteousness. Uh, um, um, you know, oh, Brother Roy, you know, nowhere in scriptures say that, uh, 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 nowhere in scriptures was it ever said that Abraham repented. Well, he did, didn't he? He was doing one thing and God said, come and follow me. He dropped everything and went with God. And he went with God, not knowing where he went. He basically stepped into the unknown. But it wasn't the unknown that concerned him. It was God that concerned him. Far as Abraham was concerned, God said this, I trust God. It doesn't matter what the future holds. I believe God. I trust God. That is faith. And that was counted unto him for righteousness. Right? As much as old, old Testament saints look forward to the cross, the New Testament saints look back to the cross. But it is the same cross, the same Savior, the same God who made salvation possible. So how were the Old Testament, uh, 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 how, how were people before Christ saved? They believed God. They looked forward to that, right? As, my, as a friend who, as the same friend who asked, about, uh, asked this question, uh, uh, when we explained it to him, he said, oh, it's like paying it forward. Yeah, it's like paying it forward. But the thing is that we don't pay anything. It was Jesus Christ who's already paid. We just look forward to, they look forward to that event as we look backward to that event. But whatever, thing, whatever the thing is, Jesus Christ had already died on the cross and shed his blood. The thing is, faith is the key, right? Faith is the key. And, um, and, and for those that believe, um, and those who believe Christ, believe God the Father. John chapter 5, verse 24. Uh, John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth, all right? The word heareth does not mean just physically hearing something. It means it doesn't just mean that it means to hear, it means to, under, it means to understand, or it means to believe. All right, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him, uh, believeth is, is no different from Abraham believing and trusting God. Um, sent had, uh, that sent me hath everlasting life, and that shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Right? And the thing is that, honestly, how were, you know, before Jesus Christ died, how were Peter, John, James, and all the other apostles saved? They believed Christ. They trusted him, right? So, um, so here are some thoughts, all right? Um, the author of salvation, who is God, meant it for everyone ever born, right? Scripture is clear about, that, about Old Testament saints being saved. Um, he, God said that he is the God of you know, he is the God of Abraham. Is, all right? Is, um, look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, the first part. Moreover, I said, uh, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, uh, the God of, 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 you know, of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He didn't say, I was. He said, I am. I am the God of, the, 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 of thy father, the God of blah, 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 blah. Although Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were long dead, God used the present continuous tense, meaning he remains their God, right? And God is not the God of the living, uh, rather God is God of the living and not God of the dead. The God of the dead is Satan, right? John chapter, four verse, uh, John chapter 8, verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father uh, will ye do, right? He's a murderer from the beginning and a boat not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh of a he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a lie and he was and is a father of it. All right. So God is God of the living. Abraham was was far as God's concerned. Abraham was alive. Jacob was alive. Isaac was alive. Um, and the thing is, salvation is not predicated on what man thinks. Uh, oops, I've got a spelling mistake there. I'm sorry. It means I mean to say salvation per God's design, not design, but design. Right. 
Uh, salvation is predicated n- not on what man thinks, but it's predicated on what God ordained, on what God designed, and what, on what God brought to pass. Right? This simply means that y- what you think or what you believe changes not what God laid down. You can be a believer, you know, rather you can be an unbeliever, you can be a scorner, you can say, wow, you know, God didn't do this, I don't believe God did that. Uh, God cannot be like this, God cannot be like that. You know, I don't believe God exists, I don't believe Jesus Christ died on the cross. It does not change God one bit. It does not change what God did one bit. All right? You can go, you can go on unbelieving, but the thing is that one day, you would have to answer for the unbelief. As I said, no choice is without consequence, right? If you want to, you want, if you want to choose to not believe, that's fine. No one is going to twist your arms. No one is going to break your toes and say, you believe, otherwise, you know, I'll break more of your bones. But the thing is that one day you will answer for that, all right? Um, this simply means, um, as I said, you know, what you believe one, and, and what, you, what, what you don't believe doesn't change what God laid down. Don't, the thing is that don't let unlearned, unlearned questions distract you from salvation. You know, some people say, yeah, how do you know God exists? Yeah, huh? where did God come from? How was God born? Who was God's parents? Don't let all those things distract you. All right? The fact of the matter is, the scripture says God's been from everlasting to everlasting. God was, before the world was, God is. All right? But eternity is a long time to regret. Don't let it distract you. All right? Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. They generate contention. Right? God, you know, God wants you saved. Simple as that. All right? So don't let silly things, or rather don't let unlearned questions um, uh, uh, derail you or turn you away to something else that's not going to get you saved. Um, read the Bible. Believe the Bible. Believe the Word of God, which is sure, which is everlasting. Right? Um, God, who said in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that He wanted the salvation of all, could not have condemned those before Christ to an eternity of wrath. Right? He, he would be, uh, you know, otherwise He would be an unjust he would be unjust, he would be a lie, and he would be untrustworthy because as said earlier in you know, Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter of, of faith, uh, you know, you know, you know, that, that chapter would be nothing but a load of hogwash. Right? So the thing is, Old Testament saints were saved because they implicitly believed God and they looked forward to God, to what God uh, would do. But far as God is concerned, because he's outside of time, he's already done it. So Christ's blood has already been shed, right? The thing is, what hinders salvation is, and you know, God wants a repentance, right? But what hinders salvation is man himself. You know, after, God, after all, God, the author of salvation, um, uh, did it right from the beginning. John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20, right? And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men, and men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. Man, the unsaved man, loves darkness rather than light because their deeds were, were evil. And everyone that doeth evil hated the light, neither cometh to the light. Hey, you know, lovers of, of, of evil, you know, you know, criminals don't go to the police station and say, hey, I'm a criminal, I steal and, you know, I steal and I murder. And... By the same token, right? Lest his deeds be, should be reproved. Man does not want to be judged. Look at Proverbs chapter 30, verses 12 and 14. Um, there's a generation that, that are pure in their own eyes. Well, you know, hey, I'm correct, I'm right, I'm pure, I've done nothing wrong. Right? And yet, not, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. I'm pure, but when God looks at these people, they're full of filth. There is, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. They're full of pride and their eyelids are lifted up. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their, jaw th- and, the, and their jaw teeth as knives, 
and to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men, right? They don't want to be judged. Hey, I'm pure. You are a sinner. No, I'm not a sinner. I don't have sin. They don't want to be judged. Man loves his own righteousness than the righteousness of Christ. He is easily offended when faced with the truth because the truth is an honest mirror and the conscience of man pricks him. Uh, Romans chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, for, by, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, uh, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. You know, in a day that God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. You know, man loves his own righteousness. He gets offended easily. Um, but anyway, God wants you to turn to his wisdom and live. God wants you to live. Why should you die, he said. You know, Proverbs chapter 8, verses 33 through 36. Hear instruction and be wise. Refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso, find, uh, whoso findeth me findeth life, and who shall obtain, uh, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? It's to turn to God, it's to repent and to trust Jesus Christ to save you. Eternity is a long time. All right, the lake of fire is hot, is beyond hot. All right? It is beyond the comprehension of man in terms of heat, in terms of torment, in terms of agony. Um, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is beginning in wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You know God is understanding. If you're not saved today, the thing is that you can be saved today. Um, you know, but all bets are off the moment you close your eyes for the final time in this existence. And judgment will surely follow. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And as, as, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to judgment. Right? And everyone will have to give an account of himself. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, great and small. All right? uh, important, not important, famous, unfamous, great and small. Stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of all uh, out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. You and I will be judged according to my works. Whether your work is evil, whether your work is good, whether your works are righteous or, or right, unrighteous or righteous, you will be judged. I will be judged. You know, I'll be I will be judged for this particular lesson, for this particular message. And God will probably say to me, Roy, you should have said this. Roy, you shouldn't have said that. Blah blah blah. I don't know. But one day, I'm going to be judged. All right, um, according to my works, verse thirteen, and the sea shall and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the de and the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they will judge every man according to their works. You will be judged. All right, uh, you know there's no there's no uh, that there, uh, uh, there's no free pass. All right, and the death and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. You can wait. But, you can wait, of course, but, and live the life that you want to live. But the thing is that you don't know when that role would, would end. Hebrews 9.27, you know, at his appointed and, and to men wants to die. Right? Luke chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy, so thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who uh, shall these things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself is not, uh, for himself is not rich toward God. The thing is that if you treasure things up for yourself, one day you're going to face God as judge on the wrong side, right? And so the thing, the thing is that what will you give in exchange for your eternal soul? Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we carry nothing out. You can be the richest man on earth. You can be Jeff Bezos. But if Jeff Bezos dies, he's not going to be bringing his riches to heaven, uh, to heaven with him. And he's thinking, you know, you know, I'm very careful to say that, right? When, he, when, Eddie, when everybody stands before, uh, before uh, Christ in judgment, we'll be standing in his domain. All right? 
one day hell is going to empty out everything and, and, and all those will be standing before Christ before they get thrown in the lake of fire. Jeff Bezos can appear before Christ, but he will not be appearing before Christ with all his wealth, with all his riches, with all his shares, with all his whatever, and say, well, you know, can I give you all these for my soul? No, absolutely not, nothing, all right? Suffice it that if you have heard this message, whether in part or full, you are responsible for how you respond to it. Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 11. And where unto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the market, in the markets calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you, I have preached unto you, and ye have not danced, you know, pay. You know, have you danced? Have you responded? I don't know. You can respond where you are. I can't see you. If you have, if you've been saved, amen. You know, I'm glad, I'm pleased, I'm happy. But the thing is that the Word of God says, you have not danced. You know, he's saying, the uh, Word of God is saying, that, that, uh, saying this of people who have not responded to the preaching of God. All right? Um, uh, you have not danced, we have mourned unto you, you have not lamented, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he had the devil. And the son of man came eating and drinking, they say, behold a man, uh, behold a man gluttonous, and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. One of the things, my question to you is, you know, it is your responsibility, right? My question to you is, will you be wise or will you be foolish? Will you be saved today? Or will you say, oh, brother, it's all right, I can wait a bit longer. I'm very healthy. I had my medical, uh, I had my medical examination yesterday and, and, you know, doctor told me, I can live on for another 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years, whatever. But God says it differently. It is appointed and the man wants to die. Thou fool, this night shall thou, uh, uh, let me scroll back a little, a little bit. Uh, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be? Right? The thing is, Jesus Christ did die on the cross. Jesus Christ did suffer for you. Jesus Christ did do this while you were his enemy, uh, while you were his enemy. And Jesus Christ desires your repentance. He doesn't want your sacrifice. He wants your repentance. He wants your faith. And he wants you to live. Will you live even today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for the preaching of this word. And Lord, I just uh, I pray that, um, that, 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 um, that it has been... Uh, uh, sufficiently uh, uh, explain that it is faith that God wants. It is trust in Him that, uh, that, that He wants. Um, and, that, uh, and, that, and that people uh, here who have heard the message will even come to trust, uh, will come to repent and trust in Christ for their salvation. Lord, uh, uh, we just ask that your word will not come back to you void, but that... Um, but that there may be rejoicing even in heaven, even today. So, Lord, we thank you for uh, for the, uh, uh, um, we thank you for your word. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you give us a, a, a good week ahead, and that you give us all safety. Um, uh, and Lord, we just ask that uh, that you preserve the souls of those here who are not saved, that you will even bring them to to, to repentance and, and salvation. Lord, thank you once again. We pray all this and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. See you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.